It's my great joy to introduce friends and colleague Matthew Gollop from the Zoological Society of London. Matt is the International Marine and Freshwater Conservation Program Manager at ZSL, which means he gets to dabble in a huge array of wonderful projects. And it can be everything, anything from the Tidal Thames Conservation Project, community-based work in Nepal with freshwater systems, establishment of MPAs in Chagos and the Indian Ocean, um, monitoring of a sustainable seafood policy, shark evolutionary conservation, and so on. Uh, today he's going to be talk to, talking to us about his primary focus, which is eel work. So Matt did his PhD studying the effects of invasive parasite on European eels, and he continues to work at the absolute forefront of conservation of eels, their management, their policy dimensions. He's chair of the Anguilla Eel Specialist Group, and that means he's charged by the global family of conservation organizations with cooperating, coordinating, and stimulating conservation um, among experts around the world. He's also the, uh, a member of the Marine Conservation Committee of the IUCN, um, a very small group that is attempting to make a very big difference. And he's very involved in CITES. You'll find Matt at CITES meetings influencing policy and contributing a lot to the dialogue about how we regulate exports to sustainable levels. And Matt still remains very involved in eel work, eel conservation work on the ground as well. And he's going to be involved in a new project um, of the Azores, I guess it is, in um, the Central Atlantic with a lot of Portuguese collaborators that's just getting underway. And Matt doesn't yet know it, but he owes me a drink for that one. So keep that in mind. Um, and I'm really, really delighted to share with you um, the work of one of the people I most respect in our field, Matthew Bellick. I'm going to sort of give you a broad overview of the work that um, myself and, uh, as importantly, many, many of my colleagues are doing for Anguilla deals. And these are species that I think a lot of people sort of look at and kind of who faces at, and hopefully by the end, I certainly see part of my role um, as an advocate for these species as, as being kind of the hype man and winning people over um, to sort of highlight why they're important, why they're interesting, and why you should care. Because obviously there's many, many species out there that are in trouble and everyone has their favor, but this is mine. So uh, the subtitle of this is also eels or why, because that's the question that I'd say over the past 20 years I've been asked most, because as I say, people do sort of look at them and kind of wonder why I would um, uh, do this. Um, so um, I'll get started. So just to, um, the Pacific coast of North America is one of the few places in the world you don't actually get eels. So um, I'm going to sort of give a general overview of the biology. So um, I hope this isn't too simplistic, but um, when people think about eels, they just think of something long and thin. And this is something I suffer from because people come and ask me about all kinds of eels when, in fact, my knowledge is actually pretty limited. I'm only specially interested in 16 species, but 16 wonderful, wonderful species. Um, you find them in temperate and tropical regions. Um, I think they're found in, I think it's maybe over 100 countries. I'm not sure, but there's a few areas in the world that we don't find them. Generally, there's like two morphs. There's uh, mottled and bicolored. Um, this, is, this becomes particularly important when it comes to trade because the bicolored species are the ones that are particularly prized. Um, but these 16 species, though they're found global, they have this very common but extremely complicated life cycle. This has multiple life stages. Um, they're catadromous, so this means that they feed and grow in continental waters, but they spawn in the oceans. So it's kind of the opposite, basically, to salmon. Um, the semoparis, so they, they feed and grow and grow and grow and grow, and then they have one big spawning um, event, and then they die. Now, some of these species can live to over 100 years, so there's a huge amount of investment that goes into this sort of single um, event. So as they go further and further through the life cycle, they become more and more precious, and the, the ones that are leaving freshwater systems to, to spawn, these are really the sort of the ones that we really need to focus a lot of our attention on. And they're panmictic. So this spawning event that occurs right across the species range, and some of these species can be found in 15 different countries. They all converge on one area. So it's not like there's sort of little breeding populations all over the place. This all happens in one single place. <clears throat> now, my personal um, expertise, or my, my, the one I have greatest knowledge of, I would say, is the European eel. 
Um, so I'm going to kind of use this as a model species. That's the one I'm primarily going to be talking about, though I will touch on other species. So just to give you an overview of the life cycle, and um, I'll go on to talk about how this um, uh, manifests itself, the European eel. <clears throat> um, is there a pointer I can use? I can dance around. Actually, I'll dance around. I've got a mic. Um, so this is sort of broadly split into um, two halves. There's the oceanic and there's the continental part. So um, the materials, they spawn in the ocean, um, produce eggs. They produce these leptocephalus larvae, which um, are quite unusual looking. I'll talk about in a second. Um, but this, this sort of uh, the, the migration from the ocean through to the continental part, where there's um, glass eels and yellow eels, that's generally quite a passive migration on ocean currents. So when it comes to things like climate change, that can have a huge effect on their ability to migrate. Um, they feed and grow in fresh water. They're, called what, they're what's called yellow eels, the sort of traditional looking um, sort of brown yellow colored. They then mature to become what's called silver eels. These are the migratory form that go back to spawn. And there's a number of physiological changes that are going here. You can see the eye gets bigger, the coloring changes, they become countershaded um, in order to hopefully avoid predation in the open ocean. Um, and then they go back and spawn. And as I say, this can be a hugely variably timed process. In the tropical species, it can be as short as maybe two, three years. In um, some of the colder, more northern environments, some of these, some of these processes can be up to 100 years. So as I said, there's often these big sort of spawning events. And for the European eel, um, we still don't really know where it happens. All indications are pointing towards uh, the Sargasso Sea. So that's quite a long way from Europe. That's from, say, parts of Norway. That could be almost 10,000 kilometers. From Morocco, the Azores, you're probably talking maybe three or 4,000. But it's a huge migration for these species to make. <clears throat> and especially when they're the juveniles, that juvenile migration can take three years. The adult migration back can be maybe a year, um, 18 months. But most of our knowledge is still based on the work that this gentleman did, Johannes Schmidt, in 1912. He was sponsored by the Carlsberg Foundation in Denmark. And he basically carried out a, uh, a cruise. He was fishing all the way back to the SOC, and he was finding smaller and smaller of the larvae. And he got back to the point where he didn't really find any more larvae, and they were really, really tiny. So logic would suggest that this is where they spawn. But we've still not ever caught a gravid female. We've never seen spawning animals. So there still is a huge amount of mystery around this. And as you can see, these aren't typical eel shapes. So this body form is really, we think, is sort of modified to allow this sort of passive migration. Um, but it wasn't until, I would say, the mid-1800s um, that they actually identified that these were eel larvae. They thought we were a completely different species. So um, just to help to put this into, for me, I'm from Scotland, so I'm going to put this into um, a regionally appropriate context. Um, you know the Proclaimers? They walked 500 miles, and they would walk 500 more. That wouldn't even get them close to the Sargasso Sea. So the eels really are going a long way for that breeding event. So as I say, I think eels are incredible, and you know, part of that is this incredible life cycle they have. But lots of species are interesting. Lots of them have incredible life histories. So why do we care? Well, for the European eel, um, this is um, the sort of, I guess, the sort of the, the key piece of analysis that occurs. This is from the ICES Eel Working Group, and they bring together a lot of um, the available data sets, and they put together this index of recruitment. So this is basically the number of larvae that are arriving in continental waters. Um, and this sort of gives us an indication of the status of the species as best as we can um, uh, interpret it. And as you can see, from the sort of 70s, 80s, there's been a, a decline. Um, now, it's quite a noisy graph. But at present, we think that from the baseline level, which is around about 1980, that at the moment, the, the, um, the recruitment is probably about um, 5 to 10 percent of what it was at the baseline. So at the moment, we're in not a particularly good situation. And this is also, this is a, a bit of an old graph, but the, the, um, uh, the, the trends are still the same. We've seen the same in the Japanese eel and the American eel. 
And these are the three kind of primary northern temperate species. Um, inter I mean, the reason we have, I'd say, such good data sets is these three until recently were the ones that were historically exploited. So a lot of the information we've got here is due to the fact that they're economically important, and that's driven some fisheries independent data. Importantly, it's driven fisheries independent data as well. So again, this is sort of a conglomeration of, of um, some of those data sets. But I mean, while there are variations in the timeline, ultimately the, the, um, the downward trend is similar, which is obviously slightly is obviously of concern. Now, again, with um, uh, the eels, I think one of the things that makes them interesting and for me makes them a real um, important species to a uh, group of species to um, understand and conserve is the fact that. Um, I mean, it's quite a reductive thing to say, but for many fish species, fishing is the major threat. Um, now, that's not always true, but that, that um, I think, is, is sort of fair to say for a number of fish species. For the European eel, there's really a suite, and we don't understand the, the, uh, the synergies between them, the cumulative effects. And so part of what we're doing is really trying to understand the threats to this species and how they all interact. So as I mentioned before, with this passive migration, the impacts of climate change and changing oceanic currents are really important. Drought is increasingly becoming a, pro a problem in some of the tropical areas. Um, disease and parasitism is, is a problem. Um, as um, Amanda said, I did my PhD on um, this particular nematode that was introduced to, the, to Europe in um, the early 80s. And we, because it infects the swim bladder and they carry out this very sort of unusual long-term migration, the impact of that parasite on its swim bladder could affect its ability to migrate and also, therefore, require it to use more energy. Um, so we think that this um, parasite might well also be um, uh, an impact on, on the species. Um, pollutants, as we know, can affect many species um, found in freshwater and marine systems. Barriers to migration has resulted in a huge amount of freshwater habitat loss for these species. Um, but because um, eels are long and thin, if they're going through hydropower um, uh, plants, they will often come out the bottom looking like that. So some species that will go through hydropower systems, but if they're smaller, they might miss the turbines. But because of the morphology of eels, they generally come out the bottom looking like mints. Um, um, predation, we're increasingly uh, finding, could be, an, I mean, uh, could be an impact on the species. And obviously, this is a natural thing and not necessarily something that we can manage, but it's really important for us to understand those natural dynamics that are going on so that we can sort of separate them from the anthropogenic threats. Um, this was a really fantastic piece of accidental data that appeared where um, eels have this uh, diurnal migration. So they attached a satellite tag to a silver eel as it was in the water sort of sawtooth migration as it's migration. And then partway through the migration, this happened. And um, what they found out from the dive profile and the temperature was that it was consumed by a pilot whale. And um, I think this big spike here is the tag getting pooped out. Um, but what they found is that possibly up to 25% of tagged fish are getting eaten. Now, that... That could be to you the fact that it's um, been tagged and therefore perhaps um, makes a, an easier snack. But experiments have been done to indicate that uh, using internal tags that those ones are consumed as well. So it, it's probably not just the tag. This is actually natural predation occurring. American eels have been tagged and they've been shown to be predated by poor beagle sharks, which puts me in a really tricky position because poor beagles are a species that I have a, another interest in. And it's like, can you endangered species, stop eating each other, please. Um, but as I say, I mean, in, in some of the published studies, up to 25% of, of these are being consumed um, by oceanic predators. And that's, that's nature, but it's really important that we understand these dynamics that are occurring in the open ocean. And um, as I said before, I mean, I'm not saying for a second that fisheries, unsustainable exploitation trade um, aren't a problem, but we need to understand the, the, the problems as a whole. We need to understand them individually, but we need to understand them as a whole. And it's really farming um, in East Asia that's driving this unsustainable exploitation and trade. And I'll come on to that a bit later when I'm talking about um, the work we're doing with CITES. That's a very, very broad overview, and it's very reductive. Um, I can talk to you. I can bore you senseless about the specifics of it afterwards, if you like. But um, 
they really will vary a lot depending on species. There's some places where some of these things aren't quite as big a deal. And that sort of, you know, again, this is sort of a, this laundry list sort of brings us again to sort of how do we prioritize um, where we do our interventions. Um, and a lot of these really aren't very well understood. I mean, there's a number of papers producing climate, the impacts of climate change using modeling. Everyone says a different story. And so and as we're gathering more and more information, these things will become more and more robust. And I think when it comes to translating the science of, um, that has sort of been born out of the research that's told us a lot of this thing, we really have to think how we translate that into management. And ultimately, most of the management and the policy that we're going to be able to do is going to apply to continental waters. Our understanding of what happens in the ocean, our control of what happens in the ocean, is ultimately very limited, as I'm sure you know yourself. So our opportunity to really help Anguilla deals is in the freshwater systems. So as I say, prioritization, I mean, that's, we've got 16 species affected by multiple threats in multiple places around the world. How, you know, I'm one person, and you know, there's a handful of other nerds like me, but we're a small in number, as I'm sure it won't surprise you to hear. So how do we go about identifying where we do things? Uh, we've got multiple th threats, species, I've sort of said this. So anyway, um, this is where it kind of brings me to the red list a bit, because that's one part of my, my role, um, both at ZSL, but as part of the, the red list, um, uh, sorry, the, the IUC and Anguilla Deal Specialist Group. Um, I'm sure most of you know about this already, but just in case, the um, IUCN Red List is an assessment of threat. It's based on population change, threats, and associated management, geographic range. Um, one thing I get hugely, fr um, hugely frustrated by is when people use the term red listed because it makes it sound like it's a negative. Just because it's been assessed under the red list doesn't necessarily mean it's in danger. So um, we carry out this assessment in order to help to prioritize which species we, we, we need to look at. Um, so the last time we carried out the assessment, 2013, we found four species were threatened, and um, the three of those were probably the ones at the time that were most traded. Four were found to be near threatened. Two were least concerned. So these are the ones that, you know, red-listed is not a term that's particularly helpful species can be found least concern, and that ultimately means that it doesn't mean we should ignore them, but it probably means that we can focus our attention elsewhere. And three, we're data deficient. Um, we actually held another workshop in November 2018, so we're hoping to update these assessments uh, by the end of, of this year. So I've painted a, a possibly a slight picture of doom and gloom there, but hopefully the rest of it will be a beautiful sunlit horizon about how we're doing things to make the situation better. So I'm going to talk about the European eel primarily. I'll talk a little bit about some other work we're doing towards the end. So the European eel, um, I think to give um, the European Union the Jews, they've really recognized there's a problem. And um, at the policy level, they've basically implemented what are called eel management plans. Um, this is to basically it sort of devolves um, uh, management and um, interventions to the national level, which I think is appropriate because, as I say, these threats um, that I've highlighted will affect the species in different ways. And so it's important that, these, um, that the interventions are done in a regionally appropriate way. So they can look at fisheries management, fish passage to try and get past these barriers. Um, they're looking at restocking, whether taking fish from an area where there's perhaps more than another place, it's whether it's useful to put it there, or fish that are perhaps coming into an area that's very polluted to get them before they go in there and then put them somewhere where they might thrive better. Um, these have been in um, activity for nine years now. And I think, I think it's a good first step. It's really good in theory. But the, the implementation of it has highlighted that there are limitations. And again, to give the EU their their reviewing it just now with a hope to, I think, to learn from these lessons, where it's worked, where it's not worked, where we perhaps have to, to sort of rejig things. And they are doing open consultation, which again, I think is really important. But there is little coordination and harmonization. So while this devolvement to the national level is important, it's also important that there's at least some ability to sort of compare how each country is doing with one another rather than isolation. And it is quite difficult to test their effectiveness because there's taken changes. Um, so I think this is a real um, point for um, not just the European eel, but all species. Because some of these species have such wide ranges, there's so many different interventions for 
um, these different threats. It's really important there's coordination across the species range. So some species you'll only find in one country, some you'll find in 50. It's really, really important that there's that, that coordination occurs right across. So um, I guess another sort of um, multinational level um, approach um, is CITES, as um, Amanda mentioned before. Um, this really links to trade, and this is sort of a, a soundbite about what CITES is. Um, there's significant trade in all eels, European eel, Japanese eel, American eel have traditionally been the, the biggest traded ones. In 2018, um, I've got a PhD student working on um, eel fisheries. Um, she was there on the first day of the American eel, glass eel fisheries, as glass eels. They can then put arms to grow them up. Uh, one kilo of glass eels was going for five and a half thousand dollars. Now, my understanding is that that's more than ivory. So, you know, there's certain species that get um, a lot more attention than others, but in fact, the trade could be even more valuable. The European eel was listed in Appendix 2 of CITES in 2007. This is basically, it doesn't prevent trade, but it, it, it is put in place to prevent unsustainable trade and use. They have to produce what's called a non-detriment finding, which basically is evidence to support the exploitation and trade of the species. <clears throat> and yeah, they basically take information around fisheries, they'll take information around threats, policy management, and produce a dossier really to sort of say, we're comfortable that catching and trading this species is not having a significant impact on uh, the conservation uh, or on the, the status of this species. In 2010, after the species was listed on CITES, the European Union decided that they weren't able to make a non-detriment finding. Um, the European eel is listed as critically endangered on the IUCN red list, and they felt that a species in this, with this critical conservation status, they couldn't make a non-detriment finding. So they banned export from the EU, and as a result, this unsurprisingly had ramifications because there were tens of tons, if not hundreds of tons, being shipped out to East Asia to the farms, and this met left meant there was a huge gap in the market. Within a year or two, trade from North Africa in the European eel, trade from the Americas in the American eel, Anguilla rostrata, and in Southeast Asia for Anguilla bicolor, just went crazy, went through the roof. Um, so this was really like market scrambling to fill this lack of supply that had been um, created uh, by the closure of um, the European eel um, export from the EU and in 20 so this is this is pre um, the ban so you can see that Canada the USA and the Philippines that's um, orange black and green they were pretty small part of the trade if you go to post the listing Philippines Canada and the USA they're probably about two-thirds of it and that all occurred in the space of maybe two or three years so that shift in trade is absolutely enormous and for some of these places, this meant there was a huge issue around capacity of how to manage that. In, um, I mean, we, I'll talk a bit later about our work in the Philippines, but um, Anguilla Bicolor for the Philippines, they, they just didn't know what to do with it. It was, just, it was like a gold rush. In um, Central and Caribbean Americas, that was another place where there wasn't a, they'd never seen these fisheries before. They just appeared out of nowhere, and there was so much money going around. So with regards to managing the fisheries, managing the trade, managing the export, there, there really wasn't the, the, the systems in place to do that. So again, I think uh, the, the EU really pushed um, within CITES to um, examine this because they sort of became very aware that their decision had, and ultimately they were just following the rules of CITES, but this did have big ramifications further down the line. So um, there was a decision made at the Conference of the Parties um, three years ago um, to carry out a genus-wide appraisal. So they wanted to examine the situation with the European eel, but they also wanted to look beyond that and see how it affected other species, which I think was a really pragmatic approach to take. Because just because you list one species doesn't mean it might not have an effect outside of those species. And so it's really important, again, this sort of holistic approach is taken. So... Ultimately, what happened, there was two um, big reports were produced after this decision, one looking at the European eel, the implementation of that, the challenges, the lessons learned. But there was a second report that were, was um, 
produced that, was looking at the non-listed species and the impact of that. And um, I was actually um, in charge of um, coordinating this with a number of um, colleagues. Um, so that was basically the first six months of last year. And um, it was sort of a gargantuan task, but it was really, I think it was a really important one that was carried out. And I do think, you know, the EU, again, took a very pragmatic approach. And I think, you know, producing these reports is fine. You know, I'm guessing they're probably mostly gathering digital dust now. But um, what I think was really important with this, there was a number of workshops that were carried out that brought a lot of the range states face to face to talk about these things and work out how they can perhaps either improve the situation for the European eel, but also prevent it for other species. So the American eel, um, there was a workshop in Dominican Republic, and that was the first time all these range states had got together to talk about eels. So this really drove some really positive outcomes. Um, again, sort of the Japanese eel, uh, there was one in Tokyo, and this picture was taken at Kew Gardens in London, where I think, I think we got about sort of 70, 80 people globally to sort of come together and talk about the situation. So while the situation for the European eel is, is still, you know, of concern, the, the focus that's been put on it has helped, really helped to drive um, some useful conversations and some useful steps forward um, for the European eel, but importantly for the other species that that listing has, um, has um, uh, had an effect on. So um, these sort of slightly jumbled uh, letters and numbers is really there's been a lot of conversations going on at the CITES meeting prior to the Conference of the Parties this year. So Stand Committee 69 and 70 and Animals Committee 29 and 30. There's been a huge focus on eels. Um, I think um, it was one of the few species at the last Animals Committee where there was a full day working group. And, you know, normally that's elephants, rhinos, you know, interesting animals. Um, but, you know, the, the, the fact that the eels had got a full day set aside just highlights how important that they're taking this. And I think it's, you know, I think for me, I think it's, it's fantastic that these problems are being examined. Again, this is another global convention, the Convention on Migratory Species. Um, European eel was listed by Monaco um, on Appendix 2 in 2013. <clears throat> and the Convention of Migrant Species is really just as it says. It's, it's sort of, it's a convention in place to deal with species that do range across multiple um, different um, uh, areas. And the European eel is obviously a, a really fantastic example of that. I mean, I've even heard people within the, the, the CMS sort of saying that you probably couldn't get a more flagship species for CMS than the European eel. Um, and again, I think, you know, this listing has really helped to drive some useful things. I mean, I, I'm not going to, I don't think workshops are going to fix the world, but I think getting people face to face and often for the first time is a really important thing so that people know who they're dealing with. So we had a range state meeting in 2016 in, in Ireland. Um, there were a number of what they call concerted actions, which are really just um, an agreement measures that countries are going to take in collaboration to make the situation better. And we had a second range state meeting earlier this year um, <clears throat> in Sweden, which again is sort of building to develop an instrument under the CMS that will again sort of like push this collaboration. And I think the important thing about the, con uh, the Convention of Migratory Species is that for CITES, most of the actions occurred within the EU. This is really looking at about the species beyond, um, not just within the EU, it's across the range. So it's going to take in places like North Africa, that often get kind of forgotten about and have less capacity. So hopefully this is going to be able to help to, to share lessons learned and, and help to um, make the approaches to conservation more joined up. So that's sort of some of the very high level stuff we've been doing in relation to the European eel. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the Philippines sort of about five, six years ago really came into, um, came into focus when the, the, the trade exploded. Um, and it was also a pattern that there's been very little um, eel, but also freshwater research in the region today. And I mean, <clears throat> I would say actually that Project Seahorse is probably behind why we've actually gone in here because um, ZSL and uh, UBC who developed Project Seahorse um, have had a presence there for so long. It meant that we had a really nice network of people within government and NGOs that we could go in myself and my sort of eel colleagues could go in and we, we were recognized and we were able to establish quite quickly. So, you know, this work, I would say, is in part thanks to the seahorses. So, thank you. Um, 
But um, it did really highlight when we went in there and we carried out a scoping trip that fresh water really hadn't been um, very well studied there. And I think, it, you know, globally, it really sort of becomes third fiddle to terrestrial and marine. Um, and this sort of really started me thinking about trying to use um, eels as a kind of flagship for aquatic conservation. You find them in marine systems, you find them in freshwater systems. And over the past sort of five years, we've been really sort of using the eel to drive freshwater conservation in the Philippines. Because the Philippines is this sort of handful of scattered islands that was sort of cast there, and there's thousands and thousands of them. And so people generally focus on the coastal areas because there's so much coast. But there are some big freshwater systems that are, do need attention. And so there was a real appetite within the Philippines to begin to, to look at these freshwater systems that had, for, for the most part, been ignored for a long time. So we carried out a collaborative project um, a, from 2014 to 2017. Um, it did focus to some extent on trade, so we worked with traffic, but also two um, Filipino um, government um, uh, departments. So there was the Bureau for Fisheries and Aquatic Resources and the Department for the Environment and uh, Natural Resources. Um, and, I mean, this is very high level. This was a three-year project with many, many outputs. But basically, our main aims were to carry out a trade analysis and to look at what had happened since uh, the European eel had been banned and suddenly this, this trade exploded. We went in to carry out baseline biological and importantly socioeconomic data collection because obviously there was a lot of people that were now making a lot of money from these um, eel fisheries. You know, what would be the impact of suddenly going in and implementing fisheries management? You know, we didn't want to sort of go in and sort of ruin people's livelihoods. Carry out freshwater habitat assessments and also threat analysis to get a better understanding of which of those threats are particularly impacting eels and what, what's um, impacting freshwater more broadly to try and develop a new management plan, but really using lessons learned from the European situation. Not for a second am I saying that the EU management plans in Europe are perfect, but we can learn like what worked for them, what didn't work for them, and how can we apply it in this new situation. And I'm really hopeful that in future, you know, the lessons learned from this could hopefully help to inform other eel management plans developed elsewhere. And we also wanted to look at whether community-based eel farming could be feasible. There was a huge demand for eel farming in the Philippines, and most of that was from outside the Philippines. And we thought, if it's going to happen, why don't we at least try and get the benefits of that within the country? So we carried out this small-scale community-based eel farming project. Um, I'm pleased to say that in 2017, we got another grant to follow that work on. So it kind of spread beyond the sort of the trade and perhaps um, still looking at eels. But we wanted to look at freshwater management. Um, and again, we carried out this in collaboration with our colleagues from the government departments. And this will run until 2020. Um, so we've, we're carrying out some tagging studies of eels to see how they use the freshwater systems. Um, we're looking at community-based freshwater protected areas. You know, everyone sort of hears about marine protected areas. But we're looking about how freshwater protected areas, which have been established in a number of places, but not in the Philippines before. So this was really a case of um, how, can we, how can we examine whether this is going to work in, in the communities here. <clears throat> we wanted to try and build community capacity and resilience, especially in relation to livelihoods. So we've established small community banks there, which is something that we've been doing right across the Philippines. Um, Invasive species, we've learned from our first project, was, was a problem there. There's a lot of tilapia stocking going on, so we're looking at how we could potentially try and limit the impacts of that. Um, and again, we want to look at whether we can um, try and, because the tilapia are put in for food, we're looking at whether we might be able to try some native species farming with the, with the local uh, community. So that, those two slides is basically five years of work. I feel, don't feel like I've done it justice. But um, they, it's, a, I mean, it, I'm, it's probably the thing that I'd say I'm probably most proud of. I mean, like the, the integration we've got with the communities there is fantastic. Like, we've just built such good relationships. We've got such good support. Um, that, and the staff members out there is six. But I would say our team is hundreds because we've got so, much, so many of the, the communities. Um, and... Uh, I think this is basically the last um, sort of section. Um, when, when I think people that know eels, when the first sort of place you think of when you think of eels is Japan. Um, as far as sort of culture, 
consumption. Um, Japan is kind of the seat of it all. Um, they have, uh, yeah, this was, this was a quote that um, you can find many like this, but customary to eat eels or unagi, which is especially rich in vitamin E on the day of doyo ushinohi to stay healthy and to help one safe uh, over the heat wave. Eating eels is a centuries old tradition in Japan. Um, this here on the left is, um, this is the sort of branding and marketing you'll see. And you can see the eel here, and it's always in that shape because that shape is actually the Japanese character for u, so unagi. Um, and um, this they call kabayaki, it's eaten in bento boxes, and this is the thing that um, people generally eat. They tend to get very excited about um, on doyo ushinohi. So this was a, a chocolate eel that I was gifted when I was out there on doyo ushinohi. And it turns out that uh, Hello Kitty also likes eels. And when I was out there, I found out that myself and I had more in common than just eels because she's the same age as me, We're both 44 years old. I think she looks better than I do. Um, but this, this centuries-old tradition has meant that, you know, there's very specific cuisines. There's particular restaurants where you go to eat just eel. Um, there's particular utensils that you use for eel and particular serving ware as well. So this is not something that, you know, I don't for a second imagine that me sort of going in and saying, hey, there's a problem, and everyone's going to say, oh, right, we'll stop eating eels. Because, A, stopping eating eels is not the only problem, and I don't think it's realistic to do that. But it's also, um, you know, I, th I really see engagement with Japan is, is sort of important as uh, sort of a driver for... Um, engaging with that part of the world generally because it, it's, it's really, um, the eel is, is sort of iconic in Japan, but it's spreading more broadly. So I think um, this to me sort of was the, the, the nut to crack. And it was um, uh, over the past sort of four or five years, I've been sort of slowly trying to build relationships in Japan. Um, but, and I think, you know, the, the information that we're gathering as we've been out there is that there is actually a declining national, deba national demand but the demand is, um, remains constant globally. So while people do have this focus on Japan, our understanding through this engagement has highlighted that it's much, much more complicated than that. Um, and I think that is a really important thing to, to highlight as well. So again, I mean, I, don't, I, I was going to say I don't spend my life going from workshop to workshop, but sometimes it feels like that. But in 2014, again, we held the first national stakeholder meeting. And, you know, for a country that has century-old tradition, it was amazing to me that a lot of the key stakeholders hadn't been in a room together. I'm not saying that, you know, it was my magic presence that caused that, but I was working with a colleague, and we just felt like, let's take this first step. And it was a really, really useful and important one. Um, we discussed conservation and management, and sort of, sort of first steps were taken. We had a follow-up um, workshop in 2016. This is the, the middle one. Um, and we carried sort of like a science evaluation of the status of the Japanese eel. But my colleague Kenzo had this really great idea of bringing in a civil society to watch and to examine and to respond to what the scientists and people like myself were talking about. So we weren't able just to sort of sit there and sort of talk science in a little closed bubble. We had to make this understand. We had to make it understandable. We had to make sure that the civil, you know, the people in the room that were there to kind of watch us and, you know, I guess sort of leave with an understanding, like really sort of um, were able to do that. And you know, they grilled us in between, like, you know, why did you say that? Or and so I felt that was a really interesting approach to take. And at the end, we had a big public um, lecture, and some of the folks from here stood up and talked. I think. I think the young lad in the middle was maybe like 11, and he got up on stage and talked, which I thought was really, really impressive. Um, but I just thought that was a really, you know, in this day and age where, you know, often workshops can just be preaching to the choir, I felt this was a really interesting approach to take. And last year, um, I went out again, and again, it was, it was really about continuing to build um, relationships. I mean, often I'm only there for a week or two, which is a very small period of time, but met with um, government, met with uh, industry, met with NGOs, 
and again, just sort of discussing how we can sort of move the move the um, uh, move the conversation onwards. So, um, that's my summary. I think there are amazing beasties that face a range of threats, um, but I think it's really important to highlight that there has been a lot of progress made. Um, hopefully, from the case studies, it sort of highlights that you know that there's there's action being taken at the global level, the multinational level, but there's also things happening um, at, the, at the, the national level as well. But I think for the European year, it's really important to look at what lessons we can learn. And that's not to say, again, that I think that the approach, the, I'd say the European year is further forward, but that's come with pros and cons. And I think it's important that we learn about, we understand that for the European year, but also for other species. And as I say, I mean, this is a bit of a, a sort of buzz phrase for me, is that I really want, I really see them as being a flagship species for aquatic conservation. If we can do something for eels, I'm pretty confident we're doing something for a lot of other species as well. But again, I think um, one, just sort of another takeaway is that the, this, these species and their management, it's ultimately globally linked. They have this very peculiar life cycle, um, and, you know, the the... the particularly with the trade, this is a huge global linkage. And I think that we need to examine this at the macro level as well as the micro. I think there's areas of focus that need a multi-species approach. Some of, for example, in the Philippines and Indonesia, they have seven, seven or eight different species of anguillids in their rivers. So if we just focus on one, it is going to have ramifications elsewhere. Um, and, yeah, I think national international collaboration is essential. I think one thing that I've learned a lot over the past year, especially working on the, the CITES reports, was that the communication within countries can be as poor as communication between countries. And that, that I was, I mean, maybe I'm being incredibly naive, but I was really surprised at that. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge that I've talked, um, it's not just me and not by a long shot, um, colleagues at ZSL, um, both in London, in the Philippines, all the members of the Anguilideal Specialist Group, my, uh, Kenzo, my colleague in Japan, uh, my PhD student, Kristen Steele, the guys from Traffic, whose trade knowledge is second to none, uh, my colleague Paul, who does a lot of work with CITES with me, and the team, uh, the ZSL Marine Freshwater team, and people that have supported all the work that I've been doing. So thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, and I'm willing to take questions, and I couldn't help but put this up because... Every so often I go into eBay and just type in eel, and sometimes it throws really odd stuff up. And I just thought this is, feels this is quite reflective of eels generally. You just sort of look at it and think, what? And people kind of do that with eels as well. So thank you so much for listening.